Our mission is very, very simple at Glint. Um, we want to make people happier and more successful at work. Um, you'll probably see lots of mission statements in your, in your own daily life. You'll probably see and hear lots of mission statements from the people in this room today. But ours is very, very fundamental. We focus on the employee as, a, as what we call a people-centric architecture. So everything we do at Glint, whether it be the survey, whether it be the action planning as a result of it, whether it be the design of the content and the implementation, has the employee in mind. So that's quite important as we think about the potential for data analytics as we, as we look not just to today, but to, to the future as well. So as, as you may have um, just noticed, we, um, in November of last year, we became part of the LinkedIn family. And that's, that's quite important because we're, we were a slightly smaller company at the time, about 250 people, based, um, started about five years ago in Silicon Valley. Uh, we're now part of a slightly less tiny organization um, being part of LinkedIn. The reason this is very important is because we, we're trying to build a, a model which is a lot more forward-looking than it may have been in the past. You may argue that just dealing with engagement surveys or 360s or exit surveys is essentially a photograph of your employee population at any given time. And then when we start to think about the possibilities, of course, treating member data and customer data with the greatest of respect, we start thinking about things like if you can build a formula almost that says, right, we know what engages employees within organizations. We know what, um, what causes people to develop within the organizations and hopefully, hopefully not lead their organizations. If we can extend that to a different model which says we can take those engagement models and use it to apply to people who have not even decided that they want to work for an organization yet. If we can build a model of employee engagement that then reflects the hiring patterns that different people are doing through their recruitment activities, then things get very, very exciting indeed. If we take the pattern of responses that says a manager, where well, I heard about action planning earlier on, if a manager gets their action plans from their reports, rather than just getting some generic recommended action points, that we get tailor-made learning, learning resources that have been supplied by, by LinkedIn that have been custom-made for them, then things get very, very exciting indeed. Now, I don't want to stand in front of you and present a roadmap today, but primarily because the, the, the roadmap is still being developed. But I want to just give some inspiration on how we can use data to, to move beyond that snapshot of employee opinion. So we have been hearing the same messages for a number of years now. We hear the, the classic things that our leaders know that engagement is important, but dot, dot, dot. Our data is becoming stale. We don't know what to do with it. Um, the market is changing outside of our control in the outside world. Um, we're not getting a return on our engagement strategy. People are doing things once a year, once every two years, and then they're unsurprised when nothing happens and people don't use the data. We're trying to move HR away from what we call, uh, well, what I personally call, I don't want to quote my organization on that, the, the data butler or the data concierge. So providing analysis and providing data to people within their business. We want them to be enabling those analytics to, to change the conversation, to help people to behave differently with their employees and to talk to them differently. Um, we also know that people are finding it very, very difficult to take action. And the thing that overrides all of this, which didn't really make it as very sexy to put on a, on a soundbite like this, is the technology is crap. Um, people have been used to very clunky technology that moves slowly, that people don't like to engage with. It doesn't reflect what they have on their iPhone or their Android um, smartphone. We needed to make something that was much more intuitive and much more engaging to actually work with. And that way, we can get people to do something with it. So it's very, very obvious for us to say, I mean, you, you heard Anne-Marie say a moment ago that the world, especially at the moment, and the way people engage with their work is changing dramatically. It's changing in terms of the technology. I mentioned the, the technology people have on their smartphones. We know that employees' needs and requirements and demands are very, very different to what they used to be 5, 10, 20 years ago. Think about how your, the organizations you've worked with may have developed their employees. Gone are the days where the training course would be, would be wheeled out for everybody to participate in. It's much more common these days for people to be responsible for their own learning. And we could also argue that it's, it's more common for employees to be responsible for their own engagement. In other words, they're not just listing out problems, they're also being a willing participant in providing solutions as well. And of course, leaders' needs are changing as well. They need things to be agile and mobile too. 
So part of my job is, when, as a consultant, as somebody who talks to CXOs and presents these data back, is to defend against defense mechanisms. So people make, frankly, excuses when they see their data, usually the ones with the lower scores. And they'll say things like, you don't, you don't understand, Stephen. My company's different. We're, our, we're facing market pressures. We've just had a leadership change. We've just done a reorganization, all of these types of things. And of course, when we change to a different customer, we find out that they're saying exactly the same thing time time in and time again. So in order to accomplish some of those things that I mentioned, we have a, a number of design principles that we've used. And we're not saying that we're special in this regard, just something that we've tried to bring together into one single platform. So it goes without saying that we need to have feedback being real time. We need to be aggregating responses as they come in. We need to be reporting them out, if necessary, as those responses come in. We need to make them a simple interface. We need to make them accessible. We need to choose the simplest items that predict the greatest of outcomes. Um, if you think about how people use predictive, insi predictive insights in the past, we want to make them more mobile and more agile as well. So not, again, just taking that snapshot of employee opinion and linking it to data that might be three, four, five years old. We want to integrate that into the platform so that if people say, I want to turn that dial and see that outcome, what do I need to do differently to get there? But primarily, we want to do so in a way which, which is accessible to people. We want to talk to them in a way that they talk to each other on the, in their daily life when they're working. So if I say to you in this room, this is a rhetorical question, um, in 12 months, with all, th all things considered, would you seriously consider taking a job here elsewhere with the same pay and benefits, dot, 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 you're going to give me the look that you're all giving me now, which is blank confusion. If I say to you something like, how happy are you at work? That's the sort of thing that people say to each other in, a daily, in their daily life. So we want to make the questions that we're asking more accessible, and it's surprisingly effective. And that, of course, feeds into the, the action. So if the content is good, if it's aligned to the strategy, if it's t talking in the way that people speak to each other on a daily basis, then, of course, leaders don't see this as an obstacle anymore. They see this as part of their, of their, of their data. So HR analytics becomes the same native information that people look forward to in the same way that a sales director might want his or her sales data, in the same way that a finance person may look at his or her data. And that's what we're trying to achieve. So the other thing that we do at Glint, which I think is, is really quite special, is that we take um, sentiment analysis. We take the comments that people leave in response to those items in the survey, and we do something which, which to our knowledge, is, is quite unprecedented. So we use it to bust myths to, in other words, to complement the quantitative data that we obtain, the one to five scales, the percent favorables, these types of things. And we use it to provide extra flavor. So when an employee takes a Glint survey, they have the opportunity to make a comment after every single question in the survey. And rather than just give you a glorified word count where we say, how many times have people mentioned the word leadership? How many times have people said communication? In 55 different languages, we can now extract the data regardless of where it came from and apply a taxonomy that says, Traditionally, we may have thought, for example, that empowerment was related to company culture or a, or a culture of trust or, um, uh, or feedback, for example, that's listed there. And what we can actually do is, is through the com comments, we can apply linkages and connections to the data in the same way that we previously would have only done with correlation and analysis on things like the, the numeric responses. So actually, when we do that, we can say, people are talking about empowerment a lot. That's the size of that bubble up on the right-hand side. Uh, we also know from that blue shading that when people are talking about empowerment, they're saying generally nice things about it. Um, not negative things, not neutral or mixed things, they're saying positive things. They're not being so pleasant about processes, they're not being pleasant about decision making. So the taxonomy will recognize the emotions that are being applied to those words. So actually, when we look at the, the natural language processing, we find that empowerment is more related to processes and decision making than what the layperson may have thought that it was all related to company culture. And that's something that's quite, um, quite special to what we're doing. And I've just had the five minute mark and I've been going super efficiently. And I think this is probably my second to last slide. So I have to either get us back on track or take questions. There it was, as if by magic. 